Are you looking for a great story? Do you love Star Wars? Do you like podcasts? If you said yes to any of these, check out the Redemption Podcast. Well, I have less in my head than you do normally, probably. You haven't met the crew I'm with. Pretty much everywhere we go, our life is in danger. Things didn't explode. That's pretty sneaky for us. That sounds horrible. Yes, please finish up whatever underhanded thing you're doing on the computer terminals at the Jedi Temple. Check out Redemption Podcast at www.redemptionpodcast.com. This is Tabletop Babble. I'm James and Tricasso. show i am very happy to bring you my interview with vincent aka dichotomous prime we are going to talk a lot about game design Uh, vince has impressed me on twitter with his ideas about intentional game design and also uh, uplifting marginalized voices not just into positions where they are working on games but into positions where they are leading the development and marketing and other efforts of publishing games. This is a really great discussion. We do use some stronger language in this episode, so I wanted to give everybody a heads up about that. And here we go. Here is my interview with Vincent. Okay, everybody. Now I am here with uh, one of my favorite people that I have followed on Twitter uh, for a while. Uh, someone who's been blowing my mind with thoughts about game design and, and the tabletop gaming industry and sort of society in general. A great human. Vince, welcome to Tabletop Babble. For people who don't know, uh, who are you and what do you do in the world of tabletop role playing? Well, um, so I, my name is Vince. I use he, him pronouns. Um, on Twitter, you can usually find me at Dichotomous Prime because I am an obstinate asshole and have chosen the most difficult to spell ha- like handle possible. Usually what I talk about is some combination of narrative and mechanical dissonance. It's also part of what I consult for um, as kind of a freelance business, as well as a cultural consultation on the portrayal of Indo-Caribbean and uh, West Indian cultures and mythos. I also talk uh, accessibility for um, neurodivergent and people who have various different mental illnesses, as I myself deal with ADHD and depression. So those are things that both kind of inform the things that I talk about. Uh, I'm also West Indian, Canadian, uh, so I do the whole political thing, both when talking about tabletop stuff and otherwise. So kind of on the whole combination of being someone who uh, is a person of color, even though I am white passing and there are things that come with that. The ADHD as well kind of informs how I approach game design related things and mechanics related things, because uh, for better or worse, I can't not fixate on things. And, you know, in my day to day life, that's kind of difficult because it's that whole thing of like, I have three things to do today. Okay, so I'm going to do the first thing. All right, well, let's break that first thing into several steps. Okay, which one of these steps am I going to do first? Uh, Okay, so how are we going to prioritize this by time, by number of steps, by amount of complexity that it's going to take, all these sorts of things. And unfortunately, I don't have the option of turning that off. Uh, So it becomes very, very difficult to uh, go about just normal people things by doing that. because, and then you just kind of end up into analysis paralysis. However, what I found, and thank you for being so kind as to say that, James, and had a, a couple of different people say the same thing, is that it also, much to my surprise and much to my kind of learning, like, wait, other people don't think like this? Because I just assumed that you know, I like Nicholas Masick, who runs Monkey's Paw Games, uh, makes some really amazing stuff, uh, and Brandon Dixon, and like uh, D. Pennyway, and uh, C.D. Huanzan. And I was just like, okay, I assumed that from these individuals who make these awesome games that they would, that they think like this. But I've had Nick, whom I've known for a very long time, tell me like, 
no, I don't know where you get these like mechanics related things because that's not how I think about stuff. Um, but I will, the moment that even if I'm not enjoying something, I will immediately go, this is starting to piss me off. Wait, why is it pissing me off? Okay, um, let me think about this. These controls feel a little bit clunky. Uh, maybe these hit boxes feel a little bit weird. Um, okay, so then what was the developer trying to go for here? It looks like they're trying to do this, but it seems like they made an interesting choice in terms of the tool they chose to use this. And so then you can kind of follow the Plinko machine of developer logic down to the end result. And whether or not it's successful or not, I can at least couch it in that process so that like, it's very rare that I will go on an extended rant about something that I think is complete and utter garbage because I will just not be spending time with that but if I start to dissect something and go, okay, I'm, I like this, but this seems like an odd choice, then it very rarely doesn't come from a place of love or at least appreciation because I know that making games is hard, making movies is hard, making TV is hard. So at what point in the industrial complex of narrative and mechanical design did something get caught in the works that caused some kind of distortion whether it was uh an organizational kind of glitch in terms of was it a human problem was it uh an assumption in the kind of game that you were making was it a lack of vision or direction in terms of we want to try and make this so we're going to pick these tools uh but a lot of things i find end up being very scattershot in terms of the you know i have played these games and i enjoyed them and therefore i want to make a game that's kind of like this but my thing and then it becomes very apparent when you read a design like that because it's a bunch of stuff like if you read a game document and you're like okay so that's from this that's from that seems inspired by this there are clearly some influences about, about, about this other thing but the underlying superstructure of what you've assembled here is this weird frankenstein's monster corpse homunculus that's just like kill me like it is just ultimately not very functional even if the parts are here and it's like the person was just like yeah people people have hearts people need hearts so i i put that in there and i'm like yes but i've you put in six of these and no lungs do you see where you may have gone wrong with this sort of thing? And so it's kind of dissecting that architecture is about what I'm about, uh, both in terms of making a game enjoyable, but also in confronting the roots of problematic aspects in no a number of different um, traditional narratives, tabletop games and things like that, and how it kind of goes beyond sensitivity reading in the sense of like there are a lot of sensitivity readers who are very very good at what they do but then who also don't have game design experience if you hand someone a like say a player's handbook just to use the most widespread example it looks like a textbook and while you can read the flavor text of, you know, the world and the lore and the forgotten realms and everything, you get to a table that's full of, well, well you get to a page that has a table that's a full of a bunch of different values and in terms of, like, uh, the implications of, say, uh, ability score improvements or detriments and things like that. And someone, though they may be a very, very good sensitivity reader, doesn't necessarily get like, okay, these numbers don't hold a whole ton of significance to me unless that person is like, say, we we had the whole like discourse over orcs or discorks um, the last little while. And it's like, okay, so now this sensitivity reader also has to be like a Tolkien scholar and maybe someone who has a history of like 
looking at different fantasy portrayals of persons of persons of color um okay and also has an idea like do you give them your play test document and go hmm that's interesting very few people ended up playing orc wizards and a lot of people ended up playing orc barbarians that has an implication on these sorts of things but those levers and pulleys are all within these numerical values and how they shake out that a person whose sensitivity reads for novels might not necessarily have the subset of experience that might make that stand out. So there's starting to be this, like, you know, cultural consultants and things like that, but this crossover in the the way in which people approach the process and a new kind of demand for a subset of skills that maybe wasn't there before or, like, wasn't, didn't know that we should have a demand for, that is now coming out and that process is very much, like, it, well, in process, essentially. So, yeah, but all about that dissection. Yeah, it's uh, and and that's really great, right? Because I I do think obviously more and more people are taking the steps to hire cultural consultants and sensitivity readers to look at their uh, you know their products before they put them out, which is a great thing. And definitely, when I started to do that and think like, oh, this is a really good thing, I should be doing this, right? And uh, and people were commenting on mechanics, and I was like, wow, right? That had not occurred to me that, like, yes, I, I, I thought maybe you should look over my fluff, but you're looking over my stat blocks, too. And you're also saying, like, well, this doesn't really make sense with what you said here. And also, uh, you know, this ability might be better suited if you tweaked it this way or if you, you know, if the numbers worked differently, right? And that has been... Uh, thing that has really informed my own design as as I'm sort of figuring things out, right? And it sounds like you, your brain in many ways always, already works at this level of something that that I kind of had to learn about the process of game design, right? Like I sat down and I was like, I want to make a magic sword. It should be on fire, right? Like, and that was kind of it. Uh, but it's like solid to- concept, solid concept. <laughs> like. <laughs> right, right, exactly. But the way that your mind works and you are looking at things and, and you break things down into the the steps in which they are taken, right, is is what you have to learn to do as a game designer. Um, and so it seems like that maybe that has, and, and please correct me if I am wrong, has that, uh, has that been helpful to you in some of the work that you've been doing? It's definitely, it's definitely helped me with, because uh, one of the other things I do is I'm a pro game master for hire, and I've been doing that for a few years. Um, and that's actually helped me a great deal because, um, and I've actually, I can count the number of games that I've played as a player on one hand. Like, I have very rarely done that. But what I find that I'm good at is that I'm in the midst of this thing and usually, and I actually like having a larger group. Like I actually like a table of five or six players, uh, which is um, from what I understand actually kind of an outlier because what can happen is that I will have this group and I'm like, okay, so the nature of just kind of the type of neurodivergence I have is this is my thought process when I'm sitting there. It's like, okay, so ahead of time, I figured out players are at location X. What are the things that they could do from location X? Okay, here's one to three different things and potential paths there. Now, while I can't make three complete quests because I don't have the time or energy to do that, I can do steps one through three on those one to three different aspects. So I put those out and there's enough flexibility that if they choose one, I have enough content for one to two sessions usually that will let them do that. Now, when they kind of start to veer towards one of those, uh, what I'm doing is I'm sitting there and I'm looking around the table and I'm like, okay, this character has this sort of interest in plot lines that they've been noticing both in terms of player preference and in terms of their character's backstory. They have this relationship with this other character. Okay, so we have that. These folks seem these trio at the back seem to be generally okay with the whole 
whole, okay, tell us what to do. Let's go to the place. Let's fight the monster. Let's get the thing that we need to do. So they're pretty okay. I need to make sure that I have something for them to do so that they're not sitting there waiting for the the battle to happen. They're not going, when do we get to the fireworks factory? Um, like, And these uh, other individuals are like, okay, so the we have these possibilities. Um, they just had a big stressful battle last time. So do I need to throw a little bit of levity in there? Okay, what is that levity going to take the form of so that the combat-centric players aren't bored? Uh, there's a festival in this town. Okay, so there's a festival. We can use skill challenges. Is there arm wrestling? Cool, they can do that. Is there a shopping thing? These players can do that. Okay, is there something related to the plot of this previous PC that I was talking to? Cool, we have a thing for them. And all in the meantime, I have one of my other kind of plot hooks that I have and I'm like okay so while that's happening is this like a session where I need to contribute to the player's emotional ebb and flow in terms of uh I'm someone who very much believes that if everything is dramatic nothing is dramatic if everything is scary nothing is scary and you need that like kind of ups and downs and things like that and so it's like is this session going to be something that contributes to where they are in that ebb and flow or are they in a place where they're happy with the flow of things thus far can i hit the switch and move them to the next stage that moves them towards big boss fight why essentially and so while that is a very difficult thing in terms of how my mind works. If I'm like, I need to work on a project today. Cool. I have this one thing that I need to do and I just need to ignore everything else and just sit down and do that. Now, I hope that your listeners will recognize that those two things are like, I'm very good at the former one. It makes the latter one very, very hard. And so the whole sort of like from 10 until 10 a.m. until 2 p.m., I'm going to work on this thing is like the, okay, uh, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that. So it's this thing where I have my notebook in my pocket at all times. And if I just hit like have it strike then i'm just like okay cool i need to do this now and i will do like six hours straight of just like a bunch of things um so it it informs and makes certain things makes me very good at doing certain things but it makes it hard to start doing them and and so it's a very frustrating thing because I've actually run across a number of different other creators who also deal with executive dysfunction with respect to either uh, de depression or ADHD or these various different things. And they were like, yes, no, this is, this is the thing. And it's kind of been under this big umbrella of just anxiety or imposter syndrome for a while, but that also doesn't really give you any tools to deal with it like there's this very kind of cognitive emotional approach to like you know you're a worthy individual and no one's gonna like hate you if you do that and it's like okay that's great but shouting encouragement when the ignition in my car won't start doesn't fix the ignition in my car so it's it's very difficult and it's kind of one of those things that really influenced my passion for accessibility because there's a lot of people who are making frankly much more bold and interesting choices in terms of their design who for instance don't get the jobs at like say Wizards of the Coast uh, because the typical office job favors a person who works a nine to five consistently and doing that sort of thing because there are ways that you can absolutely deal with like neurodivergence and like uh different patterns of working and things like that. Uh, like there's kind of the whole thing that I do that I refer to as building the fence, which is kind of defining the problem in as specific a means as possible. From what I understand, the neurotypical brain kind of goes like, okay, I have a thing to do. All right, cool. And they just kind of automatically have this idea of these are the steps I need to do to do this. Okay, I have an idea of what it is that I want to do right off the bat. Whereas if you go make me a table of magical items and I am like, 
I I have a hundred questions I need to ask, and I will make you the most kick-ass table of magical items you have ever seen, and it will blow you out of the water, and I it will win you all of the awards. But I need you to answer these questions for me first. It's like I'm very good at solving problems, but I need that problem defined in as specific a way as possible, which is why I tend to be better at consulting than just like go out there and make the thing because when the possibility space isn't defined then you can do anything becomes i usually do nothing yeah i i saw the other day um ashley warren was saying you know that some of the worst advice is to is to go out there and make the thing because nobody nobody ever their fir- especially like your first time out right just makes the thing you do research you google you and you define like you you come up with your in your mind an idea of where you want to end up and you figure out a way to work towards that right the idea of like me just saying to you, go make a role-playing game uh, is a daunting task for anybody. And so what you're saying is, right, like the way your mind works is you would want to know what kind of role-playing game am I making in as specific terms as possible. And then you would be able to sort of make that happen once you had all of your requirements down, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think kind of comes back to uh, a topic that I kind of bullet pointed when we were talking uh, via DMs on Twitter, which was designing with intent. Um, and there have been, uh, for instance, like uh, Ajay Pandey, which um, please, Ajay, contact me if I'm mispronouncing your name, who creates uh, Bolt RPG. He had um, basically, Jeremy Crawford had this claim that uh, fifth edition is a toolbox. And a lot of us were like, Mm, I don't know about that. (laughs) And AJ kind of broke it down to be like, 5e has a lot of holes and it capitalizes very successfully on the, it's not a bug, it's a feature sort of uh, mentality in, in the sense of like, there are these different things that you can kind of fill in these spaces for. And there's an entire cottage in- industry of people who have done that. But what he broke down in this thread is it's like, it's also because 5e is, it is focused in the sense of it has a 30 year avalanche of momentum behind it that says people want this kind of game which is, you know, a game that has an abundance of rules for combat-related and violence-related resolution mechanics. But also, there was a pivot, like, say, with 4th edition that said people were starting to get a little bit overloaded with crunch, people wanted some more options in terms of being open for roleplay, so they kind of, sort of, did that. And it was one of those things where by kind of, sort of, they didn't define role play in such a very, very specific way that you think of like a Pathfinder thing that's like, uh, in this scenario, you can have the the NPC or you'll have a, a table that's like a full page long that's like modifiers to persuasion rules that are like, you know, the, the shopkeep had a good sale day. You get a plus three and it's just all of these different things. So they just kind of broke it down to like advantage and disadvantage and then leaving it up to the DM to determine like what your DC is, uh, what's feasible in terms of what you can and can't do and that sort of thing. And I think because what the alternative before was uh, leading to was, you know, a lot of power creep where for some reason at level 10, the DC for convincing a shopkeep of a thing that you would need a DC 10 for at level one is now a DC 30. And there's no reason why it needs to be a DC 30 uh, because it's not like a super limit break X shopkeep where they're just like super powered. But then the reason why that exists is so that by level 10, you don't have players like bards and rogues who just effectively have mind control and they can just get whatever they want. So basically, there's a lot of these things that have kind of filtered down. And again, I refer to kind of the Plinko game of like the history and heritage and the mechanics as they previously existed uh, that have kind of filtered down to the current version of the game. But it's this, once again, this mishmash homunculus of a role-playing game that does a 
a thing well, and then they uh, changed kind of in that philosophy over to, um, and there have been like, you know, the actual head designers of the game have said this to where they moved away from a model where we need to have very specific rules because if we don't have very specific rules, then the players will ruin everything. Uh, and we need to stop the players at all costs from ruining our game. What? Um, and they put a lot more on that of the onus of the DM, which I think is a double-edged sword. I think it was overall a good decision, but what didn't happen was that they didn't give, they didn't replace all of those modifiers and tools with the appropriate tools on the DM side to judge those things. For, for instance, uh, we're talking about persuasion checks, for instance. Um, and how, uh, are you, are you, have you read through any of like the Forged in the Dark games uh, at all? Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. I love those games. Yeah. And so we're going to take the example of Sway, uh, which is kind of one of the, so for, I'm just saying for those folks who might not be familiar with it, is kind of one of the, the, the social mechanics there. But specifically in terms of, the definition of what sway is, it says there under it, you cannot sway someone who does not have a reason to listen to you. Now, that just seems like a throwaway sentence, like, yeah, cool, that makes sense. But I see that in terms of a game term in going, that says to the GM, these are the circumstances under which a player can sway. These are the ones in which they cannot. And you might be able to use command or you might use a piece of information you have about a hostile NPC that like can help you make that, turn that into a, a sway role. But you contrast that with say, um, uh, I'll take for example, uh, Dimension 20's campaign Escape from the Blood Keep, where uh, Ify Nwadiwe's uh, rogue, uh, Marcus, had a plus 14 to persuasion. The most extensive tool that you are given as a DM in terms of making a role harder is just a basic idea, like there's one table of difficulty classes and then disadvantage. A rogue with a plus 14 to persuasion says, your disadvantage. Oh, reliable talent. Okay, cool. <laughs> so the only real thing that you have is your DM judgment call, which luckily Brendan Lee Mulligan is an amazing DM and is very good at like going, okay, so at the final battle, the, the orc commander is going to go like, don't listen to him, attack him before he gets to talk and like all this sort of stuff. <laughs> and that was kind of him in a very fun way being like, okay, okay, I think, I'm, I think we're done. I think we're done. It's fighting time. But um, if you have a DM who hasn't been DMing for 20 or 30 years, who is coming into this with a player who is ostensibly playing the rogue in the way that the player is supposed to play the rogue, which is the rogue is better than anyone else at being a, a skill monkey, and they're playing it the way that they're supposed to play it, but you have to GM fiat your way out of these situations, then I feel like that speaks to a lack of definition of like, well, you know, ask your DM. Cool. Well, your DM can be a lot of different people. It can be someone very experienced. It can be someone very new. Uh, the table can be very different. And I think that what's maybe lacking is the tools beyond just going you get final say you're the god of this world it's like once again shouting encouragement at me when the ignition switch in my car doesn't work doesn't help me fix the problem i need these tools so i think that that kind of lack of focus and this very kind of archaic Garga gygaxian gargax okay cool i have a name for a new npc enemy now i'm gonna write that down um <laughs> yeah <laughs> Gargax. Yeah, take that for any of your demon campaigns, James. That one's for free. <laughs> you can have that one. Um, but it's, it is the reason why we don't have those tools, or one of many, is that there is this very archaic Gygaxian idea of the the values of the DM, uh, their confidence in terms of knowing when to fiat something and when not to, just never really got challenged. 
And in the same way that the need for safety tools never got challenged. Uh, and there is not a Wizards of the Coast published book that is on safety tools. There's a Monty Cook Games one. There's a bunch of other blogs and things on it. Not a single thing. If you want to look through like the DM's guide, it's like, okay, well, you want to make sure the game is fun. Cool. Operationally define fun for me. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Right. And, and this is a thing I see all the time. We often see the, the 5e hack of something, right? Somebody takes 5e and hacks it for an IP, right? They say like, Hey, here's my mass effect 5e hack. Right. To me, when I look at something, right. And, and somebody is hacking 5e, I often say like, okay, I, I get why you're doing this. D&D is very popular. A lot of people know the rules, makes it a little bit of an easier sell uh, in that case. But there are so many great games out there. And it, it, when you look at D&D, when you look at the rules, right, yeah, how do you level up? Uh, well, monsters are worth experience points, right? Okay, so it's definitely a game about killing monsters, right? Well, let's look at all the class abilities. Well, like, were we maybe 80% is, and that's probably like a very... Uh, I guess it's probably more like 90% are all about how you can kill monsters better, right? Yeah, um, kill or neutralize or incapacitate. Exactly. Like. Yeah. Overcome the overcome the challenge of violence, right? In one way or another. Or even the ones that aren't violence are with they are defined by avoiding violence right yes yeah that's so perfect. even if you have an ability that allows you to get past something without hurting it the nature by which you have to define that ability is already defined by the design space that is dominated by combat so ultimately it's heads i win tails you lose uh and that default shapes that whole thing which is kind of why i think that uh, with the whole thing is like, you know, there's a whole 60 game jam going on in like itch.io right now, uh, which is and I feel that this might be a controversial statement, but I don't think that Jeremy Crawford and Chris Perkins and sure as f not Mike Merles uh, are the people to fix D&D for 6th edition. And I don't think that any number of people they bring in for consultants or sensitivity readers or writers are going to do that because ultimately all they're doing is checking their math and what the same people who brought us a lot of the flaws in 5e are going to have and who have dominant uh, experience with just D and D for twenty or thirty years is that they're going to write a D and D game and then they're going to hand it to editors and go make it not racist, and they're going to go make it be more about social stuff or all of these sorts of things, and it kind of ends up being this very like you know uh, what's it called uh, like Ready Player One. I can't stand that movie. Uh, no, but no. The, uh, <laughs> but the, you know, the trailer parks with like all of the trailers on top of each other and they're just yeah. slammed together. And it's this weird sort of, that looks precarious and not well designed. It's like, yeah, but there's a restaurant on the 34th floor. And it's like, great. Um, and I think that kind of what needs to happen is that um, they step aside and like a, a dungeon commander or a Tanya DePass or a Gabe Hicks is in charge of a of a 6E game. And then they go, okay, so here are some things that we can help enable this. Because it's like, do you want to make a better version of what you're doing right now and one that expands and addresses all of these issues? Or do you want to look like you're doing it? Because as a lot of, uh, and I'm sure that Leona Maple and Kiana S and a lot of other people who do sensitivity reading can attest to this, is that the problem with it is that they don't actually have to use or listen to anything that you tell them. And so if you are a team of white people who hire POC to write for you and are like, we're diverse, it's like you still get to sign the paychecks and you still get to say yes and no and kind of make those final choices and define the directions of the design. And so this whole thing of like, cool, uh, put the money in the 
fucking bag and like step aside and like help us do this thing because you're not the guy. And it's kind of, that's a hard sell. And a lot of people don't want to take that step of being like, I'm not the guy. I will who, like, who's, who's the guy or girl or non-binary gender fluid or a gender person. And I will lend my resources to making this happen. Not a lot of people will put up their hands when they say that. Not a lot of people will. Um, And so that's kind of where we get left off with this movement of people who are like, okay, so we're kind of fed up with how Wizards has uh, addressed or failed to address a number of these different issues in this very kind of like, "Mm, okay, we're going to toss a shilling to the plebs and they will be happy about it for another six months and, you know, we'll raise some money for charity, et cetera, et cetera. Or like, hey, look, the the melanin quotient on one of our streams is actually above 0.025. And all of these various different things. And a lot of people are just kind of going, like no one is going to like you know the president of tabletop games and sending in the people to to help from up high so if change has got to come it's got to come from someone else and i think that that's really cool as much as i would love for all of these issues to be addressed i I don't see it kind of coming from that or at least with the whole thing of like you need to kind of just threaten their bottom line in order to get them to do something and that's like it's not even just kind of um it's just they they, they're a corporation they they're a business they understand one language that's that and so the whole thing of like ah hashtag fire mike merles but i'm still gonna play D &D and like promote it and everything is like i don't know if you understand how this works like you could very well be a a very good hearted person and like care about this stuff but if you go to a company and you go i really want you to change this thing and they go oh well okay, are you going to are you going to stop buying our stuff if we don't well no um all right uh are you going to stop promoting our stuff if you don't well, I mean, that would, it'd be hard to get viewers on our streams if we don't do that. Uh, all right. Um, are you going to stop making third party content that extends the longevity of our brand? Well, there's a lot of freelancer designs. Hello? 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 Like, and it's just, yeah, no, like, why would they listen to you? Like, and, and that's kind of, it sucks. Believe me, and I think everyone would love it if they didn't have to go to that place because a lot of people have a lot of positive experiences with playing D&D and getting through a lot of tough parts in their lives uh, with tabletop and through the community that comes with it. But it's kind of like, that's activism, baby. Like, that, that sucks, man. Sucks to suck. But if you want the thing that you want and you want that change then you kind of have to go like well all right you don't have to do it but then evil hat's gonna get my dollar or money cook games is gonna get my dollar or all of these other things are gonna get my dollar and like sometimes kind of doing that is painful on your bottom line or harder to get people to get together on a game team to develop something uh but that's that kind of thing where you have to ask yourself okay well do you want this change or don't you do you want to talk about it or don't you? Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. Right. Like you, you only have so much power in certain situations. Right. And I also think it, it relates to what we were talking to about earlier. Right. Because, because the, uh, there's this, uh, it's not a bug. It's a feature mentality. It's like, you might actually be happier playing another game. <laughs> if, if, if your D and D game, isn't that combat heavy. Right. And there's plenty of other combat heavy role-playing games too out there. Um, but if your D and D game, isn't that combat heavy, it's, uh, it's not a bad idea to maybe check out something and see, is there something that is right for you? And I also, I really love the idea of, of, of switching, right? Essentially, we're talking about like, instead of people who are on the design team right now at Wizards of the Coast making sixth edition, whenever that may happen, the idea that they would set hire a new team and say, we are now the consultants who will perhaps weigh in occasionally, but you don't have to listen to us and you have the final say, I think is really 
an interesting idea or to even just fully get out of the way without even consulting at all, right? And it's interesting because fifth edition, you've described it as this like homunculus. Um, and part of that is that it was like the you the addition to unite all fans, right? And and we've got to get something in there and it's got to be D&D. Because of that, right, when you go through the monster manual, there's no monster that hasn't appeared in a previous edition. There's no, uh, like, like it's got some new new mechanical ideas, right, and, and that kind of thing. But I do think, like, now that there's all of these people who started playing role-playing games with 5th edition or in the era of 5th edition, I think 6th edition is really a chance to, if they have some sort of plan that is uh, like what you're saying, right? With totally new blood, you know, marginalized voices who are in the position to actually call shots and not just hired as freelancers, you might get some amazing things, right? Because when I see what people are doing with no dollars, <laughs> the amazing games, right? <laughs> yeah. With no money. Yeah, uh, exactly. Like I can't imagine if you had the backing of Hasbro, the success of fifth edition behind you, um, what what might be made. And and that really excites me. And it excites me because like I want to see what someone else is going to do with uh with sixth edition, right? I feel like we know what the 5th edition team would make. They made 5th edition, right? (laughs) Hey, everyone. We're going to take a quick break and then back to the babble. Hey, it's Mike Shea of Sly Flourish and author of The Lazy Dungeon Master and Sly Flourish's Fantastic Locations. My show, The DM's Deep Dive on the Don't Split the Podcast Network, features a one-on-one discussion with guests like Sean Merwin, Enrique Bertrand, Teos Abadia, and more. Once a month, we dive deep into a single D&D topic and answer your burning DM questions. Watch us live on Twitch, on YouTube, or on our podcast on the Don't Split the Podcast Network. Let's dive deep. Let's get back to the babble. Do you know those, there are these memes, uh, and I think like Owl Turd is kind of the main source of them, but the like, oh, last year was pretty hard, but now we're getting to the end of it. And just kind of the whole like, oh, you young, innocent soul. Right, right, yeah. And just like they keep getting grittier and more scarred and everything. And it's like, I think we have an idea what 6th edition would look like if the team who is working on 5th and all of the different sort, like Splat books works on that. And I think that the whole idea of, you know, the the Crawfords and the Perkins and things like that being consultants instead of being the ones in charge and the Ray Winninger and, you know, whatever, is that it's not as if they don't have valuable things to add. Because uh, you and I both know uh, Jess Meyer, um, a Burst of Hope, who uh, they are, I am in awe of anyone who has managerial and project management skills. I do not have that. And if I'm going to roast my fellow indie tabletop game designers, designers for a moment. We have a lot of graphic designers, we have a lot of artists, and we have a lot of game writers. We don't have a lot of managers and human resource people and producers. Uh, And we have a few people who are excellent at that, and they usually end up being very, very successful. But there is, uh, as much as we all hate the, the corrupt retail and service manager that many of us had to deal with for many, many years, there is something to be said for using that superpower for good. Uh, So if you are someone who, um, if you are a white man who has done D&D for 30 years, maybe you're not the person to talk about how you can fix racism in the game or how you can uh, make Dungeons and Dragons not about plundering the ruins, the sacred ruins of cultures and taking their But what you can do is go the architecture of the team usually looks like this. The lead time on a piece of art that looks like this kind of looks like this sort of thing. Okay, what kind of budgetary allocation are we going to do that? Okay, maybe we can do a bunch of kind of budgeting and work around the logistics of making that happen. And I think that those are underappreciated and very valuable skills because like, no one is like, 
Leslie the accountant, come on out here. Everyone's <laughs> like, oh my God, you made this monster with like six heads and three asses right. that spit acid. And that's the person who gets like the, like, oh, this amazing sort of thing. But there are people who, who make the stuff run. And I think that if you are going to reshape the machine that makes a, um, makes a D&D or even to for me to be bold about it for indie tabletop games to start creating a uh viable large alternative uh rather than this cottage industry of a smattering of small individuals then that organization is kind of necessary And there's a lot of people who have a lot of kind of connections who we collaborate and we hire people for freelance and we do all of these sorts of things, but it's still kind of this, uh, you know how I made the reference to you open a book in an indie tabletop game and it's a bunch of stuff and it's a bunch of very well designed stuff, but it's a bunch of stuff and it's very rarely unified and it's very rarely organized in a way where all of the component parts complement one another and they result in something that is a very uh, powerful and overall better whole. And I feel as though the indie tabletop scene represents that in a macrocosm in a certain way because you have a very a bunch of people who are very good at a bunch of different things who are kind of doing their individual projects but there isn't this um frankly and you know may god strike me down for saying the heretical word corporate structure to it and much in the same way as i though your listeners may not take this impression from how i've kind of on D&D a lot of this time, I am also the person who is, who kind of wrinkles their nose when I hear uh, indie tabletop people say that D&D does nothing right. And I'm just like, that's, I'm, if I'm just being empirical about it. That's not true. Like it's, I'm like, like, frankly, it's like, listen, I respect you. And I think you're an awesome designer. You're really going to tell me that D&D does nothing right and it's only branding that's the reason okay all right um and there is something even if you don't want to do D &D and you want to do something different there is something that you can scavenge from that junkyard uh and much in the same way as no one wants to be the corporation that uh puts profit over harboring a long-term sexual abuser for instance uh no one wants to do that that doesn't mean that you automatically have to go you know no gods no masters we design like men and like you know all of these sorts of things and just completely abandon that structure because these these things in this organization has like led to dividends and you don't always have to look exactly like that but evil hat does it differently and monty cook games does it differently and things like that and i think that from the abundance of very skilled and capable designers if we could have people who were like okay you go there and do this you go there and do this we need this done by this time this is our timetable and if we could kind of and people would be like oh, oh shit okay i got to get to drawing uh because like you know the in a creative industry the non creative people kind of get short shrift but they are needed and necessary and i think that there is something to be learned from that yeah, totally, totally. And I think uh, having a, a position like a producer, right, who is uh, uh, managing everything and managing all your creative people to uh, to make sure that they're on the job <laughs> and, and hitting their deadlines and uh, taking care of their needs when, you know, uh, somebody gets sick or somebody has a baby or any, any number of things that can come up is a great thing. And I I would love to see like many, many different games uh, be able to uh, to rival and challenge D and D because I think it's good. It would be good for D and D, right? Like it would it would probably change the face of D and D in a good way and and improve that. And it would also be great for the tabletop gaming world. 
one of our, our fears, right, from learning more games comes from the fact that D&D has these three giant textbooks. And it's like, well, not every game is a giant textbook. Some are, some are, you know, and, and that's fun too. Uh, I love giant textbook games, but it's also, you know, you can, you can easily pick up uh, anything from a one pager to, uh, you know, the Pathfinder 2 core rulebook to in between, uh, to the, the black cube of invisible sun. So there's a, a lot of different things out there. Vince, this is awesome. Like, I really, really appreciate you uh, coming on and, and chatting with me. You are, uh, as always, on Twitter and on this podcast, blowing my mind. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I, I actually wanted to ask you, and like, there's been this voice in my head, in, in, in the back of my head, that's like mid rant, that's like, remember, just ask, ask him what his thoughts are on these sorts of things. And I'm like, oh, shut up, you, I'm talking, like, you know, all these sorts of things. But, um, so, and, and I don't say this in terms of like trying to fish for a compliment, but is there something like, what was it about something that I posted that you thought was mind blowing? Because I, like I said, I've got this very kind of maybe self-centered idea of like, okay, I'm just kind of in my thing and I'm glad you appreciate it and that sort of thing. And that kind of comes from a year, like years and years of being able to learn to accept compliments at all, which is, you know, you're being very kind. I appreciate it, that sort of thing. But at the same time, I just kind of go like, okay, all right, thank you. Uh, but like, so so what is it that is that is different or that is like antithetical or maybe just kind of odd about the, the way that you saw me kind of like break things down. Cause I'd like to, I'm not going to lie. I'd like to exploit this in order to get money. Uh, <laughs> if I can over the yeah. course of my career. So definitely, definitely. So first let me say, uh, everyone should hire Vince. Um, <laughs> uh, thank you. I appreciate it. And then, so the other thing that, uh, so one of the first things that, uh, I, that comes to mind for me, and I think about this a lot is I had posted, uh, and this was, this was months ago when, uh, was sort of, I think I first started following you on Twitter and you had said, uh, I had posted a, I was, I was trying to work on non-lethal spells for a friend who had asked me, and I had posted this spell uh, that has since been depowered, uh, largely due to a, a lot of your comments, right? And it was just a, a friend wanted a pacifist ranged spell, right? He wanted to be able to cast a spell that, was, that wouldn't burn his enemies to death, like a cantrip. And so I made this spell called Bigby's Baby Hand, and you were like, this baby hand is very powerful. And I was like, well, you know, like, and, and I remember I said, like, this was kind of my reasoning, and this is what I was thinking. And you were like, well, you know, I'm not sure exactly what your design intent is. If you want to play a cartoonish game and, like, there's... You had said, like, there's merit to that, right? Like, it, it, maybe you want to play a game where you have this ridiculously good cartoonish uh, cantrip, and that's okay. And But, like, it was clearly sincere, right? You weren't mocking me. Uh, and I was like, oh, wow, this is so true that maybe you do want to play, a, like, right? And that's when, and I, and I think about intentional design a lot in, in what I am doing, right? Um, because I think that's, the really the the only way to to design is to think about like what do I want this game to accomplish? What do I want players in this game to do? What do I want the the game master to be doing? Right? Like what what is the game about? And I th like I was like wow this is great. And we had a, like a good back and forth. But you were also having a back and forth with people in the comments about things. So I thought that was really uh, really great. And then the other thing that I am thinking about like specifically is this morning. There was a thread uh, that you had with, I think it was Nick, right? Uh, Nick Butler, yeah, yeah, yeah. The creator of Tidebreaker RPG, who people should absolutely go check out Smunchy Games and Tidebreaker RPG and check that out. Yes, absolutely. So this, this great thread um, about level design, but also about like, and, and you had mentioned this earlier in the podcast about how the way you run games and the different choices that you see players having and the, the way you go from there. And then also like how you design boss battles and that you put a lot of work into your boss battles, which I think is great. Um, because when we think about, we want boss battles to be special, right? Um, we want video game boss battles. We want the showdown and a climax in a comic book or a movie or a novel. We always want to be special, right? And so thinking about that kind of different thing. And I would say, uh, 
I've seen a lot of different things like that from you that make me think about like, oh, I do this, but I I didn't realize, like I never put it into words, right, as a designer, or I don't do this and I should, or these are things that I think about all the time and I really agree. Uh, so, uh, so that's great. But then the other side of it is like, you are one of the first people to say, and I follow a bunch of different people on Twitter, like not only do we need to hire marginalized voices, right? Great, good, yes, absolutely. But we need to put them in these decision-making positions. And that was one of the first times in my brain I was like, oh yeah, like we do a lot of lip service and we do a lot of freelance hiring, right? As, as, a, as a white guy, right? I, I can tell you that Many, many companies are are hiring now people of color, black people, uh, indigenous people, uh, people from the LGBTQ community, all kinds of uh, people who are not cis straight white dudes, but they're not putting them in any decision making capacity. They're not art directors. They're not uh, the lead designers on products, right? They're not. And, and like that was like, wow. So not only about game design, but also about the way we should be approaching game design teams and changing things um, and hopefully is, is going to, uh, to up my own game. So really I should, I should pay you is kind of what it comes down to. Um, so <laughs> if you ever have a project, I would absolutely like if this, if this podcast and the exchanges we've had on Twitter have been any kind of notion, I think we both have a, a similar kind of design philosophy, which is like you start with what's the emotion. And then you go, okay, here's my toolbox. How do I make that happen? Or because, you know, you can't control how people are going to feel and you want to allow that freedom and that wiggle room, you at least go, okay, so there are these tropes in these things that succeeded at doing this. So how can I best recreate this and translate this into a medium that we are, that we're working within? Um, And I think that that kind of in kind of tying it all into game design is the fact like, you know, you keep getting samey stuff because you keep having samey people making the samey decisions. So when you put different people in charge, it's not like, you know, you <laughs> you grab a black person off the street who's done some art and you poke them and they're like, make it, make it good. <laughs> and it's like, that's not how it works at all. Like, <laughs> right, uh, right. <laughs> there's this very sort of like, uh, I need to, I've been accused of racism. Come to me, my minorities. Come to my defense. Like, <laughs> right. like, like someone had a very poor thing turn out for them who were just like, D&D isn't colonial. Everybody come out and like, right. and it was just like, oh, this is not going to go how you think it is. <laughs> no, it is not. It is not. Um, And I I think that that um, in terms of designing with intent and kind of um, on, on those threads and that sort of thing is that you can try to make a game for everyone. And like, you know, D and D five E did that. Uh, And like we, abundance of problems i won't belabor the point in terms of that and kind of holes and different things or you can go there's a very specific thing that i want to try and do and this is going to enable gms or players or whoever in order to do that and then there's kind of this meta narrative about like and no matter what you do let's have safety tools and let's have a like i think it would be really cool to have a book that was just so you want to GM. And it was like on a system agnostic. If you look at the progression of, uh, we talked about how in 3.5, who, where the philosophy was, we have to stop the players at all costs. And we're going like, okay, how about, and we moved to 4E and 5E and going, okay, well, how about if we trust that the players have positive intent on the whole and we put the responsibility and trust that the GMs are going to be capable of doing that. Good philosophy didn't really give them the tools to think about it. And so we get things like our RPG horror stories, where you get a lot of tales about very power-hungry GMs. And there's this very, I almost want folks listening to think about this in a cultural, anthropological sort of way. As if you think about the, like, 
historical forensics or archaeology as you try and construct a narrative of how cultures evolved and where the emphasis changes depending on what era of history you're at. Um, in looking at this as a pattern is first we had stop the players at all costs. We have four and five E of the players are well-meaning. They might occasionally do something that's like, eh, and so we're going to trust the GMs to do this and they have the measure for. They didn't really give them a whole lot of the tools and we got these reactions of a lot of these negative horror stories about power hungry GMs. So now you get a lot of these indie tabletop reactions of going um gmless games do we even need to have a gm our gms players uh which you know take a shot because that happens every three weeks or so that topic comes up uh, <laughs> but uh and then you also have things like forged in the dark which i have which are very interesting because they villains don't have stat blocks and villains aren't monsters and the GM actually doesn't almost roll dice at all. And it's kind of, I see very in the, the theme of questioning the implicit assumptions inherent in the way we design things is going, all right, so what was the point of this? And there's whole like, you know, well, the GM had all of this power and they would put like OP monsters and they would make them able to do all of this sorts of damage. So what we're going to do is we're going to give players an inherent safety tool in the rules in the term of resisting harm. And then we are going to just basically say to the GM, uh, the villains are events that happen to the players and the players get to determine how to deflect or redirect the narrative in terms of that way. And I think that that is a very interesting intent. But then when you look at the tools that are used to create that, okay, so let's, to break it down into super simple detail, in uh, 5e, the DM can f*** with you in terms of fudging roles and making monsters really powerful and making stuff not work because plot. So Forged responds to that by going, okay, we're not going to have that lever there to make it satisfying and get GMs overly invested in their NPCs because that's your character, that's your baby. You don't want your big monster to go down in two turns and GMs start getting butthurt and defensive and they go, ah, oh, your thing that neutralizes all my stuff doesn't work. Okay, so we're going to remove that temptation by doing this. The consequence potentially of doing that is now tra translating from I roll to f with you and I can fudge the dice or modifiers to do that to I f with you, roll to resist me f with you. And while the intent is to go, all right, let's remove this lever and this incentive for a GM to act in this way, the ultimate result is that you have almost stratified the power dynamic in a different way, which is that, okay, the, dice, the GM doesn't roll dice. Okay, but that means that the GM can fiat being able to just say, uh, the assassin stabs you and you take level four harm and die would you like to resist? And it's kind of this, I almost encourage designers and writers right now to be historians. And as much as I am very much on the, as being someone with executive dysfunction, I, it is very difficult for me to start learning games and takes me a very long time to do it. As you've seen, I've written a thread on it before. I encourage you to look at it from a historical longitudinal perspective in going, because all of this stuff doesn't exist in a vacuum. All of this stuff exists as reactions to experiences about what came before. Um, and just be like, okay, I had this bad experience. How do I curate my experience so that it's better? I started GMing for that reason. I believe Matt Mercer actually started GMing for the exact same reason. Uh, a lot of people started designing their own game because they were unhappy with what was being offered then. Um, and so all of these, like you know, once again, to belabor the Plinko game of history analogy, uh, the you have these little, like, bits and bobs and obstacles that the tabletop 
space bounces off of as we move down through history and all of these various different things are responses and replies and uh exchanges in the overall discourse of what our design looks like and i think that that's relevant for learning from mistakes in the past but it's also relevant in terms of how we inform things going forward for the future and i think that in the same way that you would get a degree in anything, uh, learning what came before and what you have at your disposal uh, will only make you a better designer and a better GM and just able to further enable positive experiences at your table and within the space as a whole. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't disagree with that. I think that's great advice, right? We're sort of uh, winding down here, Vince, but uh, as we're Wind it down. Is there any sort of final thoughts you have that you you want to leave people with? I do think, and this is something not design related, but more related to the tabletop space in general, which is that I, and this may be a character flaw, I'll leave it up to the listeners to decide. I have kind of an inherent distrust of positivity. And the reason for that is that I have found positive folks to often maybe be less observant of what is going on around them. And they may be good hearted. And I think that they may be um, wanting to see the good in people. And I think that's a very understandable human impulse. However, there is an inclination, and especially with the state of the world as it is right now, for folks to want to retreat into what makes them feel like things are okay and what makes them feel like the folks around them can be trusted and can like inherently and will do the right thing and don't need to necessarily be considered with a critical eye. Uh, And that's not necessarily me saying trust no one and all that sort of thing, but there is an inclination to let bad things happen by inaction in the service of positive feelings or kind of this this very kind of mutually positive experience because you have had a positive experience with this person or with this industry and things like that. And I want to encourage my fellow creators and people in the community to if not embrace, then lean into the discuss- the discomfort that there may be something wrong in this scenario that you don't know about. And that if ultimately you want to make a better space for yourself and for those who are not being represented and who are not being given a platform, a lot of it is not fun to do. And I hate to rain on people's parade in doing that but it is there's not a feel-good kind of aspect to a lot of activism there is asking hard questions and pressing hard questions and following up on them to make sure that ultimately at the end of the day whom you are supporting are people who are doing just acts And that is an ongoing process that never ends. And so to remain, as it says in my Twitter handle, solidarity and vigilance is that that is the name of the game. There is never an end point where you spike the ball and you say, everything is good now and it's been solved. We did it. Utopia. We did it. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) exactly. And I think that the world that you will help make or help prop up the voices that we'll make will come through facing that discomfort that though someone might be using positivity or inclusivity and diversity as a brand, look at their inclusion and diversity team. Who's getting paid? Who's getting the kudos for doing it? Is it mostly white people? Uh, Who is the voice that you are hearing? Um, are, is there a lot of silence? Look at the likes. Like, just do the drop downs in the likes for the posts that you make. Is it marginalized folks who are following you? Is it the same people? Uh, is it a lot of folks showing up to give you a pat on the back? And 
I'm only just reaching the point now where I have in my following what I like to call hot and cold running praise. If I say something, there is about a dozen to two dozen people who will show up to like that. And I can get that dopamine hit if I want. And I want to implore the individuals who are listening to this to resist taking that easy dopamine hit and to question what that means and whether it means you are feeding into people's uh, willingness to ignore systemic oppression or not, um, you know, engaging with these sorts of things or not propping up these other things in order to benefit themselves. And it's an uncomfortable and it's a hard process, but I think that it is ultimately not only worth it, but it is mandatory. I would like to repeat that one last time. It is mandatory. You don't get to go, I'm an ally, but I do this. Confronting and making these spaces better is a mandatory part of the process, as much as it is playtesting, as much as it is hiring consultants. It is about constantly confronting what your individual biases are and whether or not you need to uh, renegotiate your ties with certain people, whether or not that's going to cost you money does not matter. Um, this is ask yourself what it is you want. If you want a better space, this is what you need to do. And there is no compromise about that. And I cannot say that any clearer than it is. The one thing that I would also repeat that you said, uh, in addition to agreeing with you and, and backing you up there is uh, that it's hard, right? Um, and that it's work. And I appreciate you saying that uh, because I, I also know you to be a person who supports and uplifts things that you think are good, right? You're not just pointing out things that are bad. You're also saying, and here is the person who's doing it right. And here's the people who are doing it well. And I appreciate that uh, about you. And I, that is one of the, the very mind blowing things to uh, have someone stand up and, and point to things that are, are wrong. And I, it's just something that I am learning to put the work in right now myself and like, okay, what do I want to be? what do I want to leave behind uh, too, right? Like, like I want to make the world a better place. I don't just want it to be positivity and, and fluffy all the time because uh, it's not that way, right? <laughs> it's really not. So. I, and I think that that lesson very much is that doing the right thing a lot of the time doesn't feel good. And I think that the more that we learn that we can we divorce ourselves from that expectation, I think that the more people will kind of learn to go like, oh, this is not a gratification thing. And it's like, well, it's not about you. So you can do that better when you kind of detach yourself from that expectation for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's really very true, right? Realizing things are not about you uh, is, a, is a great place to start. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Vince. For, uh, where can people find you uh, if they want to uh, you know, uh, work with you or, or get some of the good stuff on Twitter or uh, other places where you might be on the internet? Well, so far, the, the main kind of bastion of where I do things is on Twitter. Uh, you can follow me at Dichotomous Prime. Uh, that's D-I-C-H-O-T-O-M-U-S-P-R-I-M-E um, on Twitter. And then my DMs are usually open for uh, individuals who want to talk consultancy, projects, all these sorts of things. As uh, anyone can tell you, I'm usually down for like a 12 post rant about like, you know, a thing that I love uh, that hopefully uh, we will get to a space where I can spend more time talking about that than the screaming hellscape outside of my window. So I, I think one of my favorite things that I see you tweet is, okay, and now this is a post to myself, to, so I remember to get off this hell site. Um, so, <laughs> and I'm like, it's this a is thing. a good reminder for me to get off this hell site. <laughs> Yeah, because you will doom scroll and it will like suck your soul like the portrait of Dorian Gray if you let it. And it's just like, okay, I'm I'm helping. And it's like, are you or are you sucking yourself into a husk that can help <laughs> no one? Go outside. Like 
<laughs> absolutely absolutely yes go outside play some monster hunter have a good time um so yes yeah well thank you so much for joining me uh and uh i hope that we get to to chat some more and work on something cool together that'd be great absolutely would love to hear it Everybody, thank you so, so much for listening. I really, really appreciate it. As a heads up, you can support the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash intracasso and by heading on over to Apple Podcasts, leaving us a five-star review. If you leave us a five-star review, I will read it out loud. You can make me say anything you want. Also, a quick, quick, quick note that my game with Roll20, Burn Bright, I did a whole episode on here with all of the uh, developers, uh, is now available for pre-order, burnbright.com. That's burn, B-U-R-N, bright, B-R-Y-T-E, Dot com. It is an exclusive science fantasy role-playing game for Roll20. You can read more about it if you follow me on Twitter at James Intracasso and at worldbuilderblog.com and over at burnbright.com. So go check those out. And also, we still got time. The Fantastic Lairs Kickstarter is going strong. We're adding all kinds of people to the team. I'm talking about Lisa Penrose, Latia Jackies, Jen Vaughn, TK, Johnson, Willie Abdiel, Leon Barilaro. There are so many awesome people on this project. So go check it out. Fantasticlayers.com. 20 drop in boss battles for your D&D 5e games. Top Babble is a show on the Don't Split the Podcast Network. It is edited by Nate Pausing. Thanks to Rudy Basso for founding DSPN with me. Our theme music, which you're listening to right now, was provided by Battle Bards. Thanks for listening. Gather round, travelers, to hear our tale. Venture Maidens is an actual play 5th edition podcast made by four longtime friends and lifetime gamers. We take our role playing as seriously as we keep our bulges tasteful. So if you're looking for an epic high fantasy tale spun by a killer cast, give us a shot. We publish new episodes every other week and live stream our game recordings on Twitch. Now get on out there and download Venture Maidens wherever podcasts are free. Hope to see you in the community, and don't forget to venture away.